Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, hear from both sides on a law that prevents cities from banning plastic bags. Also tonight, we'll meet the new director of the State Veterans Affairs Office, and we'll have a summer travel forecast from AAA. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A new law that prohibits cities from banning plastic bags continues to raise a number of questions regarding state control of municipalities along with environmental concerns. Now here to discuss the issue are State Senator John Cavanaugh, who supports the law, and Lauren Kuby, a councilwoman from Tempe, which considered a ban on plastic bags. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Uh, why is this a good law for Arizona? It's a good law for Arizona because <clears throat> banning plastic bags and, and other disposable cups like styrofoam cups are a very bad idea. Uh, there are health problems involved with the, ba the bags that are reused. Uh, there's also the cost issue. They're much more expensive, both the cups, containers, and the bags, <clears throat> which the cost gets passed on to consumers. There's the burden it places on businesses that work, uh, that have stores in multiple jurisdictions, where you could have an, a plethora of conflicting regulations on bags and cups and what have you. Uh, there's the lack of convenience. Uh, you know, the, the, the so-called styrofoam food containers uh, are, are the best in terms of leak-proof and they preserve the, the heat, which, makes, uh, which reduces bacteria. Uh, so for health reasons, for cost reasons, for convenience reasons, and for business uh, development reasons, uh, it's best to keep it the way it is, choice. People can choose to use their own bag if they want to, uh, or they can use the one in the store. Why is this a bad law for Arizona? <laughs> This is terrible public policy. First of all, I, I know, Senator, that you've, you've striven your whole life to fight for local decision making and, and you've, you've railed against uh, federal overreach in state affairs. And to me, this is an example of the state of Arizona reaching into areas, waste management areas, that cities traditionally uh, manage to you know, get involved in our business. So Tempe has a problem like many cities in Arizona. We have a huge amount of plastic waste. We have 50 million plastic bags, single-use plastic bags circulating in the city of Tempe, 500 bags per year per person. So this creates a problem with our landfills. Only 5% of these bags are recycled properly, and those that are attempted to be recycled, they get jammed in the recycling machines. As a result, our taxpayers have to pay, in the case of Tempe, $210,000 in costs that are associated with the jamming of the recycling sorters. Okay. No, I'm not, I'm not well, done. Yes, you are, because I want to make sure he gets a chance okay. to speak, please. Oh, real quick, number one, there is no landfill crisis in the state of Arizona. I lived in New York where there was a landfill crisis. I was a council member in New Jersey with this landfill crisis. These were problems. There is no landfill crisis in the state of Arizona. Secondly, all levels of government have to live within the constitutional constraints that are imposed upon us. Arizona can't do immigration law. Uh, the federal government can't do local law. And the state constitution clearly states that there are areas where the state can preempt local laws. Public safety and health, and there's health issues with banning, with, with requiring these reusable bags, and also to prevent the, the, the creation of conflicting, confusing laws all over the state that will befuddle businesses. Okay, please. So landfills, there's tremendous costs that cities incur with landfills in transporting plastic badge bags to landfills. This, the county of Maricopa spends uh, $3 million a year, 150,000 hours of labor time, 65 tons of trash, 90% of that is plastic. And so there's a lot of costs involved for cities and towns. It's my responsibility as a council member to put politics aside, to put ideology aside, and try and save the taxpayers money. And that's what cities are trying to do. Cities are where we innovate. Cities are where we solve problems for our constituents. Cities is where we manage our waste stream and try and do what's right for the environment, for the citizens of Arizona, and for the economy, this is triple bottom line, and it's rare in public policy where you can find such a sweet spot where you can benefit the economy, the environment, and citizens at the same uh, time. It's, it's not true. Number one, jamming machines. You know, the recyclers went crazy when the post office went with these stamps that don't require licking because it was jamming their machines. Mm -hmm. You know what? We didn't suddenly go back to the old days. They re-engineered and they fixed their machines. So and I think we can. And I think we can fix machines so a little plastic bag. We're not making bag, up these numbers. So he the plastic to... bag doesn't. Jam 
jam the machines. Now let's talk about the, the amount. People say, let's get rid of the styrofoam coffee mm -hmm. cup, right? And let's use a paper one instead. Number one, styrofoam is cheaper to make. Yes. It is lighter, there's less transportation costs, yes. both to the store and to the landfill. And, styrene and, the, and the replacement your blood, and the replacement is a carcinogen. and the replacement for the the styrofoam, which is light, mm -hmm. is a paper cup, which when you use coffee, you usually require a double cupping or a separate sleeve, which is heavier, more transportation costs, takes up more space in the landfill. Okay. So all of your arguments mm -hmm. are, right. are wrong. Please. That's why a lot of business businesses give incentives to encourage people to reuse bags. So these bag programs that we're seeing all over the country. We see best practices, ca cases of this all over the country. They've, they have really profound results. We have cases in Washington, D.C. They reduced their plastic, single-use plastic bag use by 90%. These facts are indisputable. And the senator would like to talk about the health impacts. I would like to comment on that. He's referring to a study that was done with 64 64 um, canvas bags that show the presence of bacteria in canvas bags. Senator, you have E. coli in your socks. I hate to tell you this, but uh, and what do you do uh, with your socks? You wash your socks. You are glancing. So, no, it's not. An, it's the, an E. coli also okay. does not live in, in dry surfaces. Right. Everybody knows. So this is a gross exaggeration brought joke. by the plastic industry. Soup. To, to make it so we can't decide these things at a local level. Supermarkets are petri dishes for, for germs. Uh, and it's not just the bags, the shopping carts. I have a study here from the University of Arizona mm -hmm. where they do swabs of shopping carts. Mm -hmm. Germs from food, vegetables, germs from, from chicken packaging, germs from the hands of customers that don't wash their hands, hands from babies. Right. Uh, they contaminate the shopping carts. They contaminate these bags. They contaminate bags here, They contaminate single-use plastic bags, <laughs> which people put these foods into and handle. And there was a University of Arizona study which showed that they were contaminated with all sorts of germs. That look, study has been mocked by Consumer Reports because of its low, it's this number of samples university. so statistically slow, low. And one other point to be really made that's 99.99% of the germs were found to disappear when you washed the canvas bag. So these laws are meant to encourage behavior with, with consumers to bring their bags in from home, from their garage, from their but car. You're not encouraging, and it's working. It's working you're not all encouraging, over the country. you're it's mandating, working. and you're banning. I have no problem with let, giving consumers choice, but there are health concerns, there are course there are concerns, there are they don't keep food as hot That's and food Trump spoils. Charge. There are health let's, concerns. Well, let's go, well, they, the health I concerns, we, I think we've health. talked about that. Let's talk about the cost concerns, because sure. there is a concern sure. that a hodgepodge of regulations from city to city means businesses, mm -hmm. increased cost to businesses, increased cost to consumers. Is that a valid argument? Yeah. No, it's not. And let's talk about the increased cost to businesses. Right now, businesses spend about two to three cents per plastic bag, which they pass on to the consumer. Under the bill that we were just starting to look at, we were just investigating an ordinance, doing everything we could to bring all the stakeholders together. Under the proposal that we were considering, the, the, um, the, the uh, retail establishment would be able to charge 10 cents or more for a paper bag. Who pays that? For a paper bag. Who pays that? The citizen would pay, the <sighs> customer would pay that. So let me finish so what I'm saying. So talk about cost right. to the public. So to what, the we public. Found, what we found across the country in 162 case studies is that you see people generally, they, they remember to bring their bags. And if they don't, they can simply buy a bag. So the retail establishment has the opportunity, point of sale, to sell reusable bags and make a profit on that. The paper bag costs five cents. They sell it for a dime. They actually profit from this. So Respond, a lot of businesses, please. It's, it's they sure. won't go back. It sounds like another aspect of business. If, if, what, if what she says is true, then all of the supermarkets, all of the convenience stores, all of these retail stores would be lobbying us to ban the reusable ban so they can have a windfall, but they're not. They're all opposed to this law because they see the problems with leaking food packages, with having to double cup coffee, additional costs for the for, for coffee cups and other, and other bags, uh, and the fact that there is a health issue, which I'm not going to avoid because I'm concerned about the health of my constituents. And it's not just that one study. You've got I'm another U of A study that literally pollution. says that these are Petri dishes <laughs> for, for disease. We've got about one minute left here. Right. I, want, I want very right. quick responses on both mm -hmm. sides here. Mm -hmm. uh, critics say that this isn't local control. This is local out of control. Respond quickly, well, please. This is an opportunity to put ideology aside, um, Senator, and to do what's best for our community. Our community needs 
to solve a waste problem. It can solve it in a way that benefits the taxpayers. You're a fiscal conservative. This would bring $210,000 back to our cities so we can invest in parks and in public education and, and um, things citizens want. We don't need to you, have waste for plastic you, bags. It's, it's a state is increasingly heavy handed over cities. This is another example. No. Respond. The Arizona Constitution delineates certain areas where the, the state government can preempt. Public safety and health is one, and the avoidance of onerous, conflicting, hodgepodge of regulations all over the state that would hurt businesses is another. And I think people can decide whether they want to bring their own bag or get one at the store. We have to stop it right there. Thank you for a spirited conversation. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay. The Arizona Department of Veterans Services has a new director. She is Wanda Wright, and she brings to the job an extensive background with the Air Force and National Guard. We welcome Wanda Wright to Arizona Horizon. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. What is, well, before we get to the, you get in the weeds a little bit here, what is the Department of Veterans Services? The Department of Veterans Services is the state entity that advocates for veterans, for employment, for education, for any benefit that a veteran deserves. And your role as director is what? Is to manage that. Um, we have several VSOs or veteran service offices out in Arizona all across the state. And we have two uh, nursing homes that um, support el elderly veterans who need long-term um, medical. Mm -hmm. and, um, and just to make ourselves available to veterans for employment, to help them with homelessness, and for education. Now, how does this department differ from the VA? They are federal and we are state. That is the biggest difference. That's the biggest, but there are other yes. differences as well, aren't Th there? There are. We file claims on behalf of our, uh, of our veterans. The federal government pays out those benefits, and so it brings money into Arizona and it pays those veterans for the things that they need. So you're a bit of a mm -hmm. conduit to yes, the VA in that respect. Yes, very much the conduit. Okay, um, a couple of nursing homes you mentioned, um, yeah. uh, veterans, but what, what are veterans benefits offices? What are they? The, they are offices that any veteran can show up to and ask for assistance, whether it's assistance for um, claiming a disability, whether it's um, um, assistance for trying to get a pension from any medical issues they may have had. Um, it offers a, a helpmate so they don't have to try to go through the system themselves right. um, to sort of navigate through the, the process. And you're, you're, you are a fiduciary as well for we guardian do. services and those sorts of things? We, we do have that as a component of veteran services. Um, we have conservatorship for some veterans who are incapable of um, dealing with their finances on their own, and we support them with uh, that program. And so basically, I guess it sounds like the goal is to basically to coordinate services and organizations with veterans. Yes, yes, to match them up. Match them up. Okay, you are the new director. What, what, what do you see as your vision? What, what would you like to change? What would you like to see improve? Well, f f <clears throat> Excuse me. From now, we are working on Roadmap to Employment. That's a new program we rolled out in April. And that is a system that will um, connect employers to our veterans as employees. And it also has a component to it that helps veterans to be, get prepared for employers. Um, things like resume building and interviewing skills 
and being able to sit in front of someone to talk and know the language mm -hmm. of a corporation to be able to be successful in getting a job. We've, we've had some shows on this actually, the difficulty that returning veterans have just getting back in society. Yes. They go to school just getting back in the concept of going to school with students who haven't had the same life experiences. Yes, that is correct. And it takes them a little while to reintegrate. Yeah. Um, and that is part of what we do as well, is to try to get them quickly as possible integrated with support. So with that in mind, what are the biggest challenges right now for your department? Well, right now, I I'm trying to work on um, getting some help for our female veterans. Um, we have approximately 600,000 veterans. And if you sort of extrapolate that 10%, there's about 60,000 female veterans. And of that, there's a, a number that are homeless mm -hmm. or who need some sort of support in their education or need employment. And so sort of what I would like to put together in the next few weeks is some kind of working group to work on those concerns for female veterans. And you, you mentioned some of those concerns. We just had a, a terrible incident outside of a VA office with yes. apparently a homeless veteran uh, who yeah. was getting some benefits, uh, committing suicide. Suicide among veterans is just... It's just, uh, it's, it's hard to wrap your arms thing. around. It's like 22 a day or something yes. like this. What kind of services or what kind of, what's out there to help these folks? Well, there is definitely a, a hotline for veterans to, for preventing suicide. And the thing about it is, um, you know, all of us need to be able to acknowledge the signs that they see. We have a lot of veterans who come home with disabilities, they have brain injuries, PTSD. And if we can um, acknowledge that they have these kinds of issues and sort of watch them and, and take care with them, we can help them and lead them to the right places that can help them. And, and those, th they are, those services are out there, aren't they? They are out there. There's a lot of counseling at the VA. Um, there are um, there are counselors outside of that. Some of the places that we have for the homeless, there's counselors there as well. Yeah. Yeah. But do they have to find it and it has yes. to find them. Yes. Yeah, and take those situations from half. Um, what does it mean to be the first woman director of this department? Well, um, I'm not sure because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am the first, but I, I, I don't think it makes me any different than any of the other directors. I'm just going to do my best to try to advocate for the veterans, either through legislation or through programs that we offer. And, um, you know, I, I, the, the great thing that I think I bring to the table is that I was a female veteran, mm -hmm. or I am actually yes. a female veteran, and I, um, I feel like some of the concerns that I had when I was kind of reintegrating into civilian life, I can help um, bring those ladies um, closer to their futures and their quality of life. I was going to say because yeah. it, it's it's it may not seem special to you, but for a lot of folks, this is this is a pretty big deal, and it's something I don't know if it brings any added pressure to you, but it does not. It does not. It does not. Not even close, huh? No. Well, no. that's good to hear. I guess. <laughs> that's, that's good. And and as far as your military career, uh, did you see something? What got you into the military? My father. My father was a Vietnam vet. He's still with us, so he is a Vietnam vet. And um, he wanted me to go to West Point. And I said, Dad, you know, I think I'd like to apply to all of them and then choose. And I did get into most of them. Um, and I decided because of the technology in the Air Force that I would go there. And I went to the Air Force Academy instead of West Point. Wow, and, yeah. and you got you all the way here. It sounds like a very I success. Did. I bet your dad's pretty proud, isn't he? He's very proud. Oh, that's good to hear. Hey, congratulations. Good luck on the job. Uh, good luck. To, I mean, there's a lot of things to coordinate here, but it sounds like uh, systems are in place and you're all set to go. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you.
An improving economy and lower fuel prices suggest that this summer's travel season could hit post-recession highs. Michelle Donati Grayman of AAA Arizona joins us now to talk about the higher travel rates. Good to see you again. Thanks Good for joining us. And, and, and I got that, uh, not that I'm a genius or anything, but I got that information from you guys. You guys are thinking this could be a, a pretty big summer for travel. That's right. As the largest leisure travel agency in North America, AAA is projecting 37.2 million Americans to travel 50 or more miles from home over the upcoming Memorial Day holiday. Of those, about 733,000 will be coming from Arizona. So we're looking at an increase of about 5% on the state in nationwide levels. This is looking to be a very healthy kickoff to the start of the summer travel season. And those low gas prices, that has to be a major factor. Low gas prices, one of the major factors. Um, also, as you mentioned, increasing consumer confidence, more disposable income, but low gas prices, definitely a big factor, especially because we're anticipating that the majority of travelers, almost nine in 10 will be going by car. So it's about 642,000 Arizonans getting on the roads um, starting next week, starting next Wednesday. So pretty big travel number there. Um, in terms of gas prices, we have seen gas prices increase over the last month. They're up about 42 cents over the last month. Today's statewide average is 275 per gallon. Um, so again, about a month ago, we were in the low twos, now we're in the high twos. But if you look at what we were paying this time last year, $3.50 a gallon oh a year ago today. So there's still a pretty significant year over year savings of about 75 cents per gallon. Don't prices, gas prices always increase over the summer because of fuel blends and those sorts of things? They generally do increase over the summer months, um, during the summer leading up to the start of the summer travel season. Um, but there's a couple of different factors at play right now. Um, so we definitely have increased demand and this is something that we experience around this time of year. We have summer blends, again, something that we anticipate. Um, oil prices have been doing some interesting things. The market's very volatile right now. We saw prices um, bottom in, in the mid 40 range. They rebounded over 50. They started to test the mid 50 range. They've lately been testing the $60 range. So you have to consider that oil prices make up well over half the cost of gallon of gasoline. So when the commodity increases, gas prices really have no choice but to follow suit. And then the other big factor that um, has been in fact impacting prices in Arizona particularly has been refinery issues. Mm -hmm. Number of refinery issues taking place. Um, sometimes refinery issues impact Arizona, sometimes they don't, depending on the refinery. Unfortunately, there is an incident um, that has been impacting Arizona prices. It's that Exxon refinery in Torrance in California. And there was some pretty extensive damage there. So we don't yet have a date when that refinery will be fully operational. But we do know that the lingering effects from that refinery have been affecting Arizona gas prices adversely. Do we have an idea of how those prices will be affected now as the summer goes on? Well, as we, um, as we move into the start of the summer travel season, AAA does project that prices will continue the upward trend that we've been experiencing over the last month. But we are anticipating that prices should remain below year ago levels um, as we kick off the summer travel season. And hopefully once that refinery becomes fully operational um, and we get the summer travel season underway, we'll start to see prices level off and we won't necessarily see prices surpass where they were a year ago. So in looking at where prices are now compared to where they have been in years past for Memorial Day, we're looking to pay about a five-year low um, in terms of gas prices before you fill up and head out on that road trip. Could we play touch and go with three dollars a gallon do you think by the end of summer? You know some places in Arizona are already doing that. If you look mm. at Flagstaff for example you may already have some stations in Flagstaff that are above that three mm. mark considering the statewide average is at 275. If you're heading to California which is one of the most popular destinations for Arizonans year-round you're definitely going to get a taste of that three dollar fuel or, or even more than that so yeah. um, be prepared to experience some sticker shock there. Hey before you go hotel motel, rental car rates, those sorts of things. What are you seeing out there for the summer? So in terms of cost, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, the cost of lodging is up over last year, the cost of rental car rates over last year, but the cost of airfare is down. So a little bit of a mixed bag there. If you're flying in about 61,000 Arizonans will be flying, you'll likely experience a little bit of savings there. But if you, you rented a car or you uh, rented a hotel room for the upcoming holiday, you paid a little bit more than you did in 2014. Airfare is lower because demand down. What's going on there? Um, you know, it, it really just depends. Um, demand, we know, is not necessarily down. Um, the last time you got on an airplane and had an empty seat next to you, you probably don't remember <laughs> that flight. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, a number of things impact air travel. So um, it could be potentially, uh, you know, travelers that booked further out took advantage of those um, of those cheaper flights. Um, it, it really just depends on a number of factors at play when it comes to airfare. I guess pent-up demand is also a major factor here, too. A lot of folks have been holding off traveling. Now they're saying, let's go. 
let's go. I don't want to stay home this summer. Let's get out of town. Um, you know, if you, if you look at East Coast travel, for example, they've, they've stayed in all winter. They want to get out. And here as well, I mean, we, we really like to kick off summer with a road trip. Um, and, and when you're saving 75 cents per gallon compared to last year, it's not a bad, bad year to do so. If gas prices continue um, to, to remain at current levels, or even if they go up a bit, as long as there's not a significant increase, this could be a really big summer for road trips. All right. Well, that's encouraging unless you're stuck behind a whole bunch of folks who are also on the road. So uh, right. we'll do our best. Good to have you here. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for joining us. Thursday on Arizona Horizon, hear about an international microwave conference being held in Phoenix and meet the new interim director of the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art. That's at 530 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.